five, four, three, two, one. Are you started? I am ready. Hi. I'm ready. Uh, Sam, you recording? Alrighty, so, good afternoon everybody, um, my name is Brent Malachi Dunn, or Lord Captain Commander Dunn is my YouTube handle, or Lord Dunn in this case, you can just call me Dunn, or Kai, whichever you prefer. I'm just going to be talking about improving imagery and descriptive language, uh, and I am going to be primarily going over... Um, characters, settings, fights, and then scenes in general. Uh, and I've prepared a Prezi. If you want to look at the share screen, I will be having using images to display the outline of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, first off, um, just kind of a little bit about me. Uh, I've been a writer for about 14 years now. Uh, I started when I was 13 or 14, and I have been working as a published author for about, uh, as a part-time career for uh, six years, uh, since I got home from my proselyting mission uh, for the LDS Church in 2017. I published my first book in 2015, but I was able, to, I uh, had to go on my mission, so I didn't publish anything for the two years that I was out. So, in terms of my book series, I have been able to publish 16 books over the past uh, few years. Uh, these are all the starter books. Uh, if you would like to look me up on Amazon to purchase any of my novels to see if I can actually put my money where my mouth is, the I would greatly appreciate it. So, in terms of the starter books, uh, these are all the ones of each of my individual series. My I have two completed series and four ongoing series. Uh, the Lost Legion and the Dark Queen series. Um, each of them is focused around kind of a different element of fantasy. One is political thriller, one is dragon rider, or generational story, and one is the uh, story of how individual artifacts affect different uh, areas, different generations of people. So, and then there's Dragon Blaster, which is basically a Saturday morning cartoon turned into a live action into a uh, prose style fiction. So, in terms of descriptions, um, I'm going to start with describing characters. So I have some artwork up here that go with characters, monsters, um, and also to a certain extent, um, non-human concepts or ideas. So, in terms of character construction and description, what are some immediate thoughts of characters that you read in a book and you see them so clearly that you can just have them right type of for, for your eyes as if you're seeing them? What are some examples that you can think of? Um, I can give an example. Sure. Yeah, go for it. All right. So I'm not sure if he characterizes as a monster, but um, when they first mentioned Voldemort, and I do apologize if it isn't. Um, when I first heard about him, I thought he was a monster. Like he sounded human, but then they would describe the black of his eyes and how the slits of his nose looked like a snake, and how his entire physique was gonkly and 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 lacking in, in flesh and it looked like he was you no know, uh, 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 more like a vampire than a human being um when they first initially talked about him 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think the only other closest comparison I could think of to a monster right now, and I do apologize, I'm stuck on Harry Potter in my head, um, would be the demon tours. You know, creatures that are, quote, moving shadows, untouched, they, they slithered across the ground without touching it, that their forms were, were what you call it, were just like mist made life that swiveled in the air, and, you know, describing what they would do when they did their ultimate deed. Um, yeah, it's like those are some creatures that come to my mind when I like automatically think of a monstrous creature. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, what about a character? What, can anybody give me a description? Uh, name me off a character from a book, uh, maybe other than Voldemort, other than Voldemort, maybe, who like has stood out in their head and that you could feel like you could very easily describe them just from how they look. A so written character? Yes. Yeah, a written Specifically character, yeah. a written character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not a written not character. A, not a drawn one. Not a drawn one, yeah. Um Something just jumped in my head just now. Uh, Bonnie from Dragons in Our Midst. The way it described her was very beautifully done. Okay. Um, How so? uh, Run me through why exactly that was. Um, Because it, like... It was uh, describing it from our main character's point of view. His name is Billy, and the way he described mm-hmm. her was uh, an average-looking blonde girl wearing a gray sweater with wings that looked like blowing honey. Okay. She okay. was a she had dragon wings, and that's how he described the color. Hmm. Okay. She that's had a, a and she had blazing yellow hair. And vibrant blue eyes that look like pools mm. of what look like mm. uh, okay. spring pools. Okay. So um, it's you... been a long time since I read that book, so I might be off a little bit. Yeah, that's totally fine. So that actually demonstrates my point that a lot of it comes from building a an evocative picture in your brain by having specific enough details that you feel like you can um, synergize the character. Now, there are two ways that you can create a vivid picture of a character. So, one example I would actually put is Blood Raven in A Song of Ice and Fire. Blood Raven is described as an albino with a strange raven-shaped birthmark on his face, which further disfigures him. He also has red eyes. And from that stark image, you get the immediate idea of, okay, this is a very distinctive looking person, and you have a very clear idea of what he looks like. He's also often described from other characters' point of view as opposed to his own point of view because we don't see it. And later on in the series, we do have him, the image of he's just sitting in a tree later on. Let me actually pull up the blood. Let me quote about Brendan. So... In terms of the three-eyed crow, uh, let me see. I think the main description is that he is sitting in a tree and that the tree's roots have gone straight through him, that even one of the roots has gone through one of his red eyes, and he's decayed as a corpse of a man. That's the main description that we get. And from there, we can very quickly get a very evocative image of a man sitting in the side of the tree, 
in the roots of the tree the, and with roots going through him and even through his eye sockets. So what would you say in terms of the imagery, what would you say is the most important part of an of a character's description? What are the main things you need to try and get across when you do that? Um, if I may? Yeah. Um, one thing that would come to my mind is that um, is that um, when it comes to describing imagery with a character, I think the most important um, trait to describe might be something that would speak to their, something that really speaks to the core of their personality, I feel. Like, it's like, even if you could make a descriptive concept of a character who is, you know, like stalwart and brave, how his armor is this or how he looks like this, like, something that can also attribute to, I think, their personality in a way is something that would be a good, like, character concept to have when describing a character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, dang, I really am on Harry Potter. Like, um, mm -hmm. all right, so I, I guess I would say kind of like um, how they originally described Dumbledore when, you know, you first see him. Like, you know, his eyes twinkling behind his moon, half moon rimmed glasses, and that there was a certain presence about him that elicited, like, trust and, you know, like, mirth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another thing that very much affects things can be how a character moves. Moves, or it's described to move. Like, if they're a soldier, they want to move in a very upright um, fashion, or even a der which, der which derivation of soldier they want. Um, because if you have a big, strong, burly soldier, you're going to want them to move in a certain way and describe them moving in that particular way. If they're more of a blade master type, they're going to move much differently than, say, a, bru a bruiser type. Does that make sense? Um, and in terms of... Oh, sorry, go for it. Okay. No, no, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, because when you have that, you have a... A sense of okay so this character moves in a certain way therefore he must be this you can also use your own the character's perspective around them to describe how they move and draw conclusions based on that um another thing that you can use to describe characters or even set up characters is by having them interact with other characters before you get their perspective uh one example is actually in my own work um what i wanted to do was uh show just a let me see and that so uh let me so uh if i could get some uh interaction from the audience let me see if this will work works to do whole file okay so if i could get somebody to read the the first paragraphs um and actually i just put something in the chat so can i get uh quets to um read read uh the thing in the chat please starting with the common room of the storm ghost yes i'm here hello hi quetz would you be willing to read i put a uh 
text, some text in terms of a kind of quick fire set of descriptions in the um, see it. Yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah, if you could read that for me, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. The courtroom of the Storm Goose was as rowdy as an inn as anybody could ever want in a tavern. The people drink and chattered. Our bloody king has done nothing for us, Tom Blake, so, just um, as the thunder clap quick, punctuated quick, his remark. Sorry. A uh, quick, quick thing. You, so the weird thing about this is you actually have to scroll to the side in order to get the full paragraph. It's weird. Oh, I didn't, oh, wait, I didn't read the full paragraph? Uh, okay, let me okay, let me adjust this really quick. Uh, I'll just put in paragraph by paragraph. One second. Okay. Let's, My goodness, it's not the whole thing. Okay, let me let me do this again. There we go. I'll just uh, yeah. There we go. All right. Common room of the storm goose was as rowdy as an inn as anybody could ever want in a tavern. The people drank and chattered, then ate and drank even more. The town had been built in the farthest south section of Catherine, close to the border with Nomriar. The black lion banner hung limply over the battle battlements of the wooden castle wall, but no one paid any mind. There was a storm outside, and there were, that was good enough excuse to get together with friends. The pub. The bloody king has done nothing for us, Tom Dletch, as thunderclap punctuated his remark. How long has he been cooped up in that damn fortress of his? Who knows if he even alive? I, old Billy, took a sip of his wine and scowled. If a war happens, we'll be the first to get raided by those damn horse lords. You mark my words. Come on, Rosie. Tom sat down again and rubbed his eye. Wait. Oh, never mind. Agreed. Agreed. Tom blinked again, then tipped his cup back. It was empty. Damn it, he muttered, voice surling as he tried to g grab the drug and refill his cup. You had enough, Tom. Rosie, the freckled ginger bar cap deep, grabbed the jug away and held out of his reach. Come on, Tom nearly fell on his face as he attempted to retrieve the liquor. Rosie easily fend him off by the simple expedient of placing her hand on his forehead. He tried to reach forward, but she kept him at arm's length with minimal difficulty. Come on, Tom, it's time to get yourself home to your wife. Oh, come on, Rosie. Tom sat down again and rubbed his eyes, trying to get a, his vision to clear. Yeah, it should be under... I heard you talking about the king earlier, is the next bit. Thank you. I heard you were talking about the king earlier, Rosie whispered. You should leave soon or else cut out that sort of talk. Oh, who is here to listen? Tom waved a drunken hand dismissively. White hand is everywhere, hiss, Rosie hissed. He stopped talking like this. We're all good neighbors here, Tom chuckled. I, the candles in the room, common room flashed out as if something had extinguished them. You should have listened to your friend, neighbor. The rich voice proceeded as sudden burst of blue light appearing in the place of the flames. The temperature in the room dropped rapidly, and the fire in the harp turned a bl bright blue, frost appearing on the logs and the stone of the fireplace. Rosie shrieked and uh, dropped the jug, but a pale figure in a black cloak caught the jug and replaced, and replaced it on the table next to old Billy. Tom swallowed and looked up at the black-clad figure standing next to his chair. It was a man with a face as white as milk, but a single bright red eye glazed fearfully down at him, while the other was an empty socket with a scar running across it. A swat of red spread across the left side of his neck, and the cheek opposite to where his eye had once been. Lord Damien Whitehand turned his single red eye toward Tom, hand ca caressing the hilt of his sword. So, neighbor, what were you saying about the king? He remarked, leaning down to lock his eyes with Tom, long white hair framing his equally pale visage. Tom looked away, rather than meeting the spectral man's gaze. Okay. 
Tom pushed himself off his seat and dropped to his knees. Please forgive me, my lord. I beg you. I have a wife and children. Please. Why are you here, drinking yourself into a sulfur? White hand frowned, tugging at the twisted red blotch on his face. If you cared about your family, wouldn't you be with them? Tom racked his sluggish brain and tried to come up with a defense for what he said. How much had this creature heard? Please, I was drunk, my lord, he begged, raising his clasped hand. Please, why should I believe you? The whale-like man remarked, drawing a dagger with his left hand. Slowly, he set the blade against Tom's eye. If you can give me a good explanation as to why you were spewing treason, I won't slice... I won't slice open your eye. Tom didn't move. He just swallowed. Please. I was drunk. I am drunk. Please don't kill me. Alright. Uh, just press the enough switch. I'm just finding it. Okay. White hand. Oh. White hand slowly retracted the dagger and began spinning it through his fingers. Fair enough, he remarked, glancing around. I didn't come here to this small town in order to eavesdrop on drunken, dissatisfied men, but to find more valuable prey. He pulled a set of pictures from his side, set them down on the table. Gasping in relief, Tom looked down at the pictures to see that they each depicted a man's portrait. These men have stolen a dragon egg from the king's own vault. I want them brought before me. Slowly, he turned towards Rosie. You know something, don't you? He remarked, casually reaching out a hand and taking her by her hair. You were concerned about my whispers being here. Were you simply childing a drunken ministrant, or were you trying to hide these traitors and murderers? Murderers? Rosie started crying. My lord, they said they were agents of the king on a secret mission. Please, I didn't know. You could. You couldn't have, the white hand said gently, releasing her to slump down on the ground. Where are they? In the cellar, she pointed, hands shaking toward the door. Please don't hurt me or my family. I beg you. Damon slowly handed her a coin and pressed it into her hand. Those men will be will be the only ones to suffer my wrath, neighbor, he said comfortably. There are four of them. Will you slay them in their sleep? Rosie asked. Oh no, that wouldn't be sporting. Damien gestured to for her to lead him toward the cellar. Take me there now, he commanded, grasping her arm and urging her to go quickly. Tom swallowed and rushed out into the night, stumbling through the rain. Uh, Damien released Rosie's arms as she pointed toward the door. There, there they are. Please, just don't hurt us. Uh, as I said, Damon said quietly, opening the door and walking in. They are the only ones worthy of my justice. He closed the door behind him and locked it. Rosie glanced down toward her belt to see that he had taken the keys with him. The sudden sound of screams and yells of horror coupled with the sounds of bodies falling to the ground. Rosie swallowed and leaned against the door, trying to hold back the shutters at the horrible sounds. Abruptly, it went deadly silent. Hand over her mouth, Rosie held back sobs of terror at the unsettling silence. The knock on her jump, uh, the knock at the door caused her to jump. Who is it? She squeaked. The key slid under the door, a bit of blood on the metal. The one who spared the drunkard, the, uh, Damien's rich voice remarked. Rosie quickly pulled the door open to reveal the white hand himself, a long pale sword in one hand, a large red and black stone in the other. Swallowing, Rosie turned away from the weapon, but not before she could see that the sword was covered in blood from hilt to tip. Not a speckle of blood stained the wrath like like man's clothes. As hesitantly she looked down the steps toward the cellar basement. The four men she allowed to hide down there lay dead on the ground, several of them missing limbs and one was decapitated. Horrified, she leaned against the wall, covering her mouth with her hand. I do apologize for this mess. Damon picked up a napkin from a nearby table and wiped wiped it clean of blood. This should be more than compensation. He handed a bag of coins to her. Thank you. Rosie swallowed and nodded, shrieking away from this creature of death and horror. Slowly, he strided out of the inn, the flames turning from blue to red, leaving a more natural light behind. 
a roar shook the inn on its foundation as a massive albino dragon with pearly white scales and bright red, bright red eyes dropped from the sky above and landed in the streets. Snarling, the beast lowered its neck to allow its master to leap back onto its back, stowing away the object in his saddlebags. Silently, the dragon spread its wings and threw itself into the air. Sagging in relief, Rosie slumped into a nearby chair and started drinking as much alcohol as she could. Okay, so I hope that this demonstrates some of what I'm talking about in terms of how you want to establish a character. Um, in terms of the background characters, what I did here was I give you enough descriptions to allow you to get an idea of what they, who they are and what they are as characters so much so that you can kind of, without me even really going to detail, you can kind of see that they're kind of lower class, they're probably unshaven, they're drinking heavily, and they're working, uh, they're pretty unsatisfied. And I don't, and the main character I want to, I describe are Rosie and um, Damon Whitehand. Now, I spend most of the description on Damon, but I do give at least a little description that Rosie has red hair and that she's got freckles. And that kind of immediately puts it, paints a picture in your head without me having to do a lot of words. However, you can still get an idea of her personality by the fact that she's just able to get the guy, put her hand on the guy's face and make it so that she isn't able to, um, uh, like, take the tankard away from her. So you get a sense of her character that way. When you get Damon, you see immediately that he has a very distinctive features, as well as you get a description of how he talks and how he interacts with people. In terms of the descriptions, what I try to do is I try to make sure that you're not overloaded with information, but I'm not under um, explaining everything to the degree where you are like, I can't picture this in my head. So. What I try to do here is put in the detail, a lot of detail up front, and then just keep reminding you of the details up front, at least in terms of Damon Whitehand's appearance, like his single red eye. Um, he's got a long scar over his, over his eye and what looks like a burn mark on his, right by his eye. So, and we also get a sense of his character by he isn't really, doesn't really need to feel the need to kill people who aren't in his way, and actually is willing to reward people who aren't necessary, who help him or were uh, maybe caught in the crossfire and weren't necessarily cognizant of what they were doing. So he's not psychopathic, he's just efficient. So that's kind of one of the main things. In terms of a monster, one of the best monster descriptions I know of is actually Robert Jordan's Trollocs and Murdral. The Trollocs and Murdral are very fat estimating in terms of how they come up with, because Trollocs are basically a mishmash of animals and human. And they are, instead of having like one who's like a wolf man and one who's a boar man. They're actually a chaotic mishmash. Like some will have bird feet and some will have wolf or for goat hooves or some will have goat horns and beaks. And all that he needs to do is to create a mash of saying, okay, this character, they all dress very alike, but each of them has their own distinct features. Whereas a Murdral looks like a pale slug white man but they don't have eyes and that's the immediate evocative description of this black clad creepy thing that has you immediately picturing a very specific image in your head and often he'll use stuff like slug white or white is a, a grave maggot very much illustrate very evocative imagery using the idea of death in conjunction with the Murdral. With Trollocs, it's very much more bestial language. 
a big part of this is picking the language that you want in terms of your monsters and your people. Um, often you've heard the phrase cat-like reflexes. That's often a characteristic that people can and use, or if they move around like a block, you can get the idea that, oh, they're, they're strong, but they're not graceful, that sort of thing. You can also get a good idea of what of the person via their clothing. Uh, for instance, in this case, this is Melisandre and Stannis from A Song of Ice and Fire. This is admittedly in description of artwork, but we get very immediate uh, descriptions where she's described as being a very flamboyant, dressed in red, always wearing like the finest clothing, whereas Stannis is more of a soldier type. Even though he's a king, he doesn't really go in for the finery type, and you can tell a lot of his character by that. One of the main things about describing characters is figuring out how you can use their description to illustrate character. Um, or even contrast character. Uh, for instance, even though there's this um, almost Gestapo spy master type introduction to Damon, he's actually a family man who has a big family and loves his children and is doing whatever he can to protect them. But we also see here that he's willing to be, he separates that from his day job, so to speak, which is the King's Inquisitor. Uh, so, uh, that's kind of the spiel about characters, both using characters, monsters, and such like in those terms, where we've gone over, figure out what makes your character unique, and figure out an evocative set of imagery. If you have creatures, pay very close attention to what kind of thoughts and emotions you want to bring out in your audience. If you want to think of them as something that's almost undead-like, pick grave animals type things or uh, imagery associated with death. Um, when you're associating with other uh, things, try to go for more vibrant imagery. Like if you're describing a unicorn, you want to be uh, just using more evocative, um, positive language, like uh, maybe silk, glass ponds, stuff like that. And with clothes, you, and even describing how a, what a character is wearing, that will allow you to very quickly demonstrate not only culture, but also the type of character that that is. So, uh, I think that now is the point uh, for our first batch of questions. Uh, who has the first question? Uh, run it by me. Okay. I have Black is King. Uh, what is your question? I was muted. Um, so, um, when I heard you describe this man, um, the Daemon, mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, 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 for one, I really liked what you did because it kind of is something of what I'm aiming for in describing characters. Um, one thing I was, I was contemplating though was when you mentioned him, um, the second time when you mentioned when you originally mentioned him. And coming in after the whole drunk man spiel, I was wondering, this is a snippet from like a chapter mm -hmm. after he's been around or something? No, this, was... is, this is his introduction. Okay, so that's his introduction. Because I was kind of wondering, like, if maybe I might have missed something. But, um, because when he had jumped into the whole, you know, asking people about a question like, where are these, you know, individuals? I was kind of wondering, like, did I miss something? Like, um, um, uh, not quite. The idea is that we go in in media res, where this is his introduction, and there hasn't there's 
it's like the cold open for a Bond movie. Something has already taken place, and he's aiming to fix it. That's that's the idea. Um, and he's not the main character. He's the antagonist of the book. And the main character, Dar Darian, has already got run off to try and find a dragon. Because he heard stories about a dragon in the in the woods up to the north and he wants to claim it as his own and i spent some time trying to describe him as a character especially in contrast with his sister and one thing that i made sure to describe about his sister is that she has six fingers on her right hand and so mm -hmm. and um as and as well as going into the dynamic of them as characters where she's very much a the older sibling gonna inherit everything and he's a little bit um, like feels like he's in her shadow quite a bit and wants to try and prove himself um, as the as a possible as a dragon lord in his own right. So that's that's kind of the idea that we're that I was going for. Um, what other questions might you have, uh, sir? I, I just had one last question because I don't want to take up any time. Um, this is from your book series or something. Yes, this is from War of the Dragons. Uh, it's book three in the Dragonlord Annals. The idea behind that series is that each successive book is about a different generation of Dragonlords. Very rarely do we have the same generation twice. Um, and oftentimes the older generation from the previous book will die um, as motivation for the plot in the next book. So it, Oh, okay, okay, an inheritance kind of thing. Kind of, yeah. That's actually very cool. All right, thank you. All right, way okay. of war of the dragons. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Does anybody else uh, have any questions uh, that they would like to ask me in regards to character descriptions? Okay. Um, I'm sorry. There was one last question I had to ask. Okay. Um, you had you had mentioned you did something I've also tried to work with. And it is the um, usage of kind of like it's like there you have this transitional flow when this man first appears, like you know the the um, the log. Um, the red flames of the log turned blue, um, a frost um, appeared upon the fireplace, the candles were all snuffed out, and like the whole room felt deathly silent. And um, the way you make it work, um, I we, we've spoken about this before, but I'm trying to understand, is there a specific um, phrasing to this kind of approach to writing? Because it is something I'm trying to do where I can keep things short but simple, but still graphic. There is there a certain phrase to that? Um. Okay. Uh. So okay. Um. I'll answer Black is King question, and then I'll get to you, Monkey Cun. I promise. So um. So this is kind of so. so there, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a specific uh, name for this kind of prose. Uh. The way that I would put it, it's either. I'd actually associate with two two distinct two authors. Um, Brandon Sanderson and Robert Jordan are particular oh. are are fans of this kind of uh, writing style, where uh, especially Brandon Sanderson, where he admits himself that he doesn't go in for necessarily purple prose. He goes in for very kind of straightforward, if evocative prose. Uh, as opposed to somebody like Joe Abercrombie, who is has purple prose, but his style is very much figuring out each individual um, internal monologue and dialogue for each character. Uh, for instance, with uh, there's uh, one of my favorite books of Brent, of uh, Joe Abercrombie is Best Served Cold, and that's because of the contrasting of characters 
in the main group. It's basically like Ocean's Eleven meets Count of Monte Cristo uh, in a medieval fantasy, uh, low fantasy medieval world, where two of the guy characters are very different. One is a thug brute who just thinks in numbers and is probably on the spectrum to a certain degree. And he just thinks in very simple terms, uses very minimal, um, like purple prosy words. Uh, whereas another character who's much more educated uses a lot of internal monologue. And even in the way that the paragraphs around him are written, when it's in his perspective, you know that his, it's his perspective because the vocabulary changes and it probably becomes more elevated. So, but to answer your question in terms of describing things, I would say that a lot of it is, for me at least, I picture it like it's happening in my head as a movie. And then from there, I just describe what I am seeing in my mind's eye and putting that onto the paper. Nice. So, nice. so when I... So essentially what I'm doing is I'm translating what I see in my head where I've created the scene almost like it's a, fi a film scene in my head. Um, that's generally what I do. Um, and then from there, I can say, okay, I need to make sure that the reader gets these specific pieces of the shot, so to speak. Like all the candles going out, that's something I need to describe the uh what color the flames are because that's a very evocative image it gets a very immediate um reaction and immediate uh like that's eye catching i guess you'd say like you need to get catch a reader's eye and blue fire was just such a good image in my head that i was just like okay that's a perfect way to introduce this character so uh does that answer your question Yes, it does. I'm always the one. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, so Monkey Kun, you had a question. So, uh, what's the correct timing of describing a character? Upon introduction, upon doing something, parts of your real characteristics would become more relevant, or as a way to hint the a possible potential uses of them? That's a really good question. So, how I would describe, how I would answer that is what is relevant take a look at what is relevant to the story once you have an idea of what is relevant to the story in the current scene you want to describe from there so uh, for instance a lot of the time in say um brendan sanderson ender's game uh, by Orson Scott Card, there's a sense of the characters get description right as they're introduced. Um, and uh, Ender's Game does this by describing Ender by comparison to everyone else. That he's a short kid, he gets bullied a lot, and he's a nerd. And that's kind of how he's described immediately on meeting him. For me, I like to um, describe a character if it's a main character. Oh, oh, I am very sorry. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I just can't hear you, Venom. I am so sorry. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. I, I'm, I'm sorry if I, if I skip over you. I, I just, it's because I can't hear you. I'm very sorry. I, I don't know why that's happening. Um, so I'm, I'm very sorry. Uh, I did not mean to mean to do that. Um, yeah, I, I, I can anybody else? I'm, I'm very sorry. Can anybody else hear Venom? Because I just for whatever reason, I can't. Uh, I don't know why that is. Um, but I'll just wait until is he here? Hello? Yeah. Okay, I can hear him. Okay. It's odd. I, I can't hear Venom for some reason. I don't know why that is. Yeah, if... Yeah, if... I um, Huh. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's... Maybe 
the volume, like click on Venom and uh, increase the user volume. That could, that could be it. Is that good? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, his user volume's all the way up, so that's not the problem. I don't, I don't know what that no, is. No, no, I'm not, I'm not on my phone is. anymore. I was on my phone earlier. Um, anymore. yeah, I don't know what the, I don't know what the problem is. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, if, but, yeah, if, if I interrupt, it is not because I, I'm, I'm being rude, it's not, not because of that, it's just because I, I just literally cannot hear you, um, either because of technical issues, so. That's fine. Maybe a good idea might be to just, uh, put the question in the chat. Yeah. Um, that might be a good idea, um, if you're having technical difficulties with me hearing you, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, but. To answer the question, I generally like to in, introduce upon introduction, um, at least their physical description. Uh, Robert Jordan does this with Randolph Thor, where he's immediately described in contrast with his dad um, as he is tall, he's got red hair, gray slash blue eyes, whereas Cam is short, um, slightly stockier, has um, graying hair, and brown eyes so generally um oh yes i actually really like doing this so in terms of the i i would say that recommending style of dress as a clue to the personality uh because it serves as two things one it paints a picture of the scene for the reader in their mind, allowing them to see, oh, okay, this is what the character looks like. This is also how they dress. You can infer a lot about a character by how they dress, whether this is how they normally dress or whether this is a dress as a disguise. Um, you can uh, show are they a spendthrift or are they are they um more um more uh thrifty with their clothing do they dress somewhere in the middle um do they dress in a way that is sexually provocative do they dress in a way that is meant to draw attention away from their physical attributes are they trying to compensate for their physical attributes or are they trying to do something else entirely um there's a lot of ways that you can do that with just even the clothing for instance just having um in this case damon in kind of a hooded black cloak and dark clothing just immediately gives you an idea of oh this guy is kind of a cloak and dagger type and that's what I want to convey in that case. Uh, let me see. Uh, are there any other questions before we move into the next section? I don't see any hands. Okay, uh, I will take that as an invitation to move to the next section. Yep. So, next bit I want to talk about is settings. So, and you can take a look at the Prezi uh, for um, as kind of a visual demonstration of what I'm talking about. In terms of the uh, settings, you can go a number of routes with that. Uh, for instance, you can go with the fantasy type. You can go with the uh, sci-fi setting, or you can go with kind of a kind of a noir detective type or modern day. You have a bu bunch of different options. It all depends on what kind of um, um setting you're going for uh what kind of the, isn't your story 
if you are trying to go for a sci-fi setting, a lot of it is going to be built around what do the buildings look like, what does the spacecraft look like, what do the vehicles look like, and using descriptive imagery. Uh, and a lot of things within sci-fi is based around taking a look at, okay, what might be the difference between, because within sci-fi, we've, we've all seen a bunch of different things, like, uh, for instance, Firefly or Star Wars. There are differing levels of technology for each planet, and that creates the ability to say, okay, so this planet is like this, and this planet is like this, and you need to use those descriptions within the, um, the structure of your book in order to say, okay, um, this can also inform on the character that there's, there's that are in it um, by describing their setting. Like if it's, for instance, a setting that looks like this, where it is extremely high quality, it's very chrome, the, um, there's bright lights everywhere, it's very industrialized, looks like business is booming, people in the higher levels are probably away from the lower left, or the lower levels are probably um, more crowded, while the upper levels are more affluent because the air is cleaner, etc. Uh, or you can go with the fantasy idea where you're describing a city, you're describing a um, uh, place where um, it can be a town or it can be a massive city, it could be something in between. Uh, most of fantasy is usually in medieval times or kind of in like low technology, maybe Renaissance era technology. Uh, you can play around with that and kind of mix in sci-fi elements if you want. Uh, Robert Jordan did this where he would often throw in bits of post-apocalyptic uh, technology into the Wheel of Time, like uh, stasis box, music recorder, light bulbs, that sort of thing. The thing that uh, has always stuck out to me with Robert, with uh, George R. R. Martin, when he's describing King's Landing, he describes it as a chaotic mess of a city that was not very structurally planned out. And this kind of contrast with Robert Jordan, where he describes cities like Camelin as like neat and order, and Kyrian as neat and orderly, and even on the on a grid type situation, which kind of contrasts with King's Landing and George Martin, where it's like a chaotic mess where it originally was just a a fort that it was eventually turned into a capital. From and one thing that George R. R. Martin always talked about is the smells of a place. Uh, Stephen King does this as well, but that's actually a really good way of using to put your reader in the scene, because one thing that is immediately evocative about King's Landing, especially in the book, is just the fact that it smells terrible. Um, no matter where you go in King's Landing, it always smells bad. Um, and that immediately evokes an image in the reader. Uh... And the um, the use of the smell idea of a smell really creates a certain image where okay, there's some filth, there's bad things happening here, and immediately puts an image in the reader's mind. Uh, that was a good. That's a good comment, Venom. Uh, Battle Chasers. I haven't heard of that one, but I'll just read out the comment. Battle Chasers is a sci-fi fantasy setting featuring machines powered by mana. One character, Calabretta, has been sentient, two is being a healer that takes care of people. Okay. That's very interesting. Okay. Nice. I like that. Huh. Okay. When... And to contrast this with... Uh, I just picked a film noir. With film noir or kind of... You kind of can do a bunch of different things. You can do... I haven't read much fantasy detective stories. They probably exist, I just haven't found them, um, where it's in the typical medieval times. Um, but 
I'm the main thing I'm thinking of is say altered carbon, where we're in a place where the lower classes are living on the lower levels of Earth or on other planets, and the rich on higher levels of the planet. So one thing to mainly describe in a film noir is you want to quickly describe the char the setting when you're coming in. Think of it like you're having an establishing shot in a movie where you give your reader the idea of, okay, this is the kind of world I'm going into. Um, I'm going to be able to see a, this kind of thing reflected on the ground and only when you get on the ground or you get into a different setting do you describe what the character is seeing and generally you want to have the character um uh within the um uh the setting and have them describe it generally it works as kind of a figure uh, fish out of water type situation that works well uh, in altered carbon it's that somebody who hasn't been on earth for a long time or haven't been on earth ever is going from the highs of highs on in the upper levels and then the um, lowest of lows and kind of the earlier aspect um, yeah I, I'm really sorry uh, uh, Venom I wish I, I could hear you let me try to disconnect and then go okay Cause like I want to okay. talk, but I don't want to interrupt him because he can't hear speaking. me. Hello. Yeah, I can't hear you. I'm really sorry. I wasn't talking a second huh. ago. What about now? I don't know what my problem is. Could be that I'm maybe I'm just because I'm using Brave or something. Okay. Yeah. I'll. I'll, uh, I'll hop so yeah, because I would love to. Yeah. If if yeah if um. Your... Yeah, let's uh How about okay. now? Yes, I can hear you now. What the hell? Yeah, I am yeah, I'm <laughs> yeah, sorry dude. Uh you yeah, no, I that I'm pretty sure that's Discord. That was Discord just sabotaging <laughs> me. Go ahead and start Probably. your stream back and now I can actually we can talk to each other and I can interact with the lesson without you know you not being able to hear me. I also want to add, like, I think it's also Discord, but his screen keeps flashing and disappearing, and it's driving me nuts, but I don't think it's him. I think it's Discord. It's, like, flashing, it's, like, it appears, it disappears. I don't know what's going on. I think that is Discord. For on my end, during the recording, that's not happening, but, yeah, that's yeah, probably I'm glad like I'm not Discord. recording, because if I was recording, you would just see a flashing uh, presentation. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So you had a lot of things to say about settings. Uh, we'll get to you in a in just a moment. Uh, so so shall we uh, talk setting right now, or shall we act, ask answer a uh, uh, King's question? Um, it really it's really up to you. The only thing I was going to add okay. about film noir and the detective uh, type setting was that my most uh, I'm most familiar with it through like occult detectivism, which is, I mean, mm -hmm. you can either have it set in like New York or uh, like Boston, like a lot of the old school detective stories in America are done, or mm -hmm. you can have it set in London, right? But that's not, mm -hmm. I don't think uh, the Victorian style of detective stories is necessarily noir, but I was just saying mm -hmm. that occult detectivism is in that same type of setting and genre. Hmm. Kind of like a supernatural or even uh, Warehouse 13 yeah. were the immediate uh, examples that I thought of. Um, so, you know, what are, what are some other thoughts on settings uh, before we move to questions? Since uh, the main thing that I have is basically you gotta, you gotta be very clear about your character and initially and then you got to describe your setting around them and use their perspective to color the differences in um what from what is the real world so to speak and this one or even just have you put the yourself in the real world but have enough descriptions to say okay there's a picture uh like 
street signs are like this, or the um, the buildings are like this, uh, and the main things are how do the, each of these pieces of description add to the mystery, either as a red herring or as just to set the scene. Uh, you got to make sure that you have plenty of utility uh, when you're describing uh, in film noir, especially, but in the others as well. That was kind of my main uh, thought. If, if you had any others, please go for it. Well, I really just had uh, two things. Uh, the first thing that's actually relevant to what we're talking about now. Do you have any uh, examples of a line from a written work that could help them get in it, uh, you know, like a demonstration of how settings are described? Okay, uh, let me see. Um, okay, let me pull up a PDF of the Wheel of Time since I, I have the file of the entire Wheel of Time. I just need to. Um, so, let me see. I do want to quickly add that I feel like the setting makes or breaks a book. Like, if you don't fully express the setting, you might have readers confused and stuff, and, or if you don't elaborate in certain portions like you don't want to overdo it because that's just you know something that's just info dumping and it could just turn off a reader but if you do it so little as well it, it could leave plot holes and stuff so i think it's very important or you just don't know where you are ever like you have no yeah. idea like where you are where mm -hmm. the story's going or anything like that mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one of the main ones that I can think of is when Ren Robert Jordan is describing Kyrian for the first time. Um, he goes to a... Um, uh, let me see. Let me just grab a... I'm going to need to... News comes to Kyrian. Uh, let's see. So I'm just going through the a massive document with the whole of the wheel of time. Uh since Okay, one second. Let me just scroll down a little bit further. Just uh, while he's leaving, the... guys, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, I would say that the Wheel of Time is a really good um, description, good way of describing things. Um, Robert Jordan specifically describes Kyrian as a very blocky, um, very orderly, very structured um, place. Uh, I think uh, in the the appearance of Kyrian is described. Let me see the capital city. Kyrian the city. So the Kyrian the city is described as a very blocky, very structured, square laid out city. Uh, there's actually an image um, uh, from, from the book the itself. Just cut out. Oh, okay. Sorry. There you go. Mm. Oh, okay. So, I see what you're doing. so so that's why. So where we have a very blocky grid-like city with a 
uh, palace in the center with or also known as the sun palace and then there's the dock side and the horror area outside um i would also use um um brandon sanderson when he's describing especially stuff in the stormlight archive where with the stormlight archive he's having to describe stuff that is completely alien to us as people on earth because roshar uh, looks something like uh this roshar stormlight archive so this is kind of the shape of the planet um this is kind of what the planet looks like in terms of the artwork. It's a very barren, rocky place with very, very few areas where you can grow food. Um, one, there's also very strange fauna as well. Like, for instance, in this world, crustaceans are the main fauna that you encounter. Like, dogs look like beetles in this world um so in terms of the setting the more alien the setting you're going to have to put in more descriptions of the setting in order for the reader to figure out what exactly you are uh kind of place you're in so uh, I think that that's the main thing in terms of settings. Let me just share back that screen. Uh, so in terms of settings, what are some questions you mind if I give a that you all that have? You just made? Sorry, go for it. Yeah, so a reference for kind of working on more alien descriptions, right? Because like you said, if it's going to be something that's foreign to most people's understanding of a city or a form of life or clothing or anything like that, um, you're going to have to try to get as close as you can because the idea is that it's something we've never seen, be uh, we've never seen before. Um, a good person to study when it comes to things like that would probably be, and I, I always bring him up, H.P. Lovecraft, because <laughs> he works yes, I agree. in a lot of his work to describe. Uh, yeah, he describes a lot of things that we've never seen before by using things that we have seen before in reference to it. Um, but mm -hmm. somehow he still manages to drive the point home that, you know, it's it's something that we can barely comprehend, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would study him if you have trouble, like, trying to describe things that, you know, that are alien. Mm hmm I gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I, I've read a bit of H.P. Lovecraft, and he does have a lot of stuff that uh, makes you really think and really evokes very clear imagery, like... The, I have a very clear picture of there's a point where this guy is taken down by his old uncle, I think, to a place where these cultists are gathering. And just for whatever reason, like just the way he described it, just this like putrid sewer with green water that uh, nobody would ever go down into. Um, and it's really creepy really scary, very evocative. There's also uh, stuff like uh, Nair Lattertap. Mm -hmm. Oh, Nair Lattertap. I actually have him in my background in my uh, better Discord. Uh, so, I'm working on a fantasy, I mean not a fantasy, a sci uh, like a sci-fi setting. Uh, what would the best way 
it would describe something that's very like futuristic but eerie in the same time like what kind of description words would you use to describe like like very because uh, like my setting um, I'm not gonna fully explain it but it's very futuristic but there's something really wrong about it that's the best way I could put it like what kind of words would you use so in terms of what words I would use for that one I would definitely go with as many um, if it's sci-fi, it would kind of depend on what is the technology level. Are we going for a... I'll, I'll give an idea. Let's just say fake things. Like, let's just say a bunch of fake animals, fake plants. Just, like, a lot of fake things. Okay. It tries to um, imitate life, but there's no life. I would use a lot of uh, play imagery in that case. The reason why I say that is because play is fundamentally a pantomime where you can take a play and put it as the fake shrubbery or kind of describe everything as plasticky or manufactured. That's actually a good point. Enigma, anomaly, strange, elusive, false. Those, those are good ideas. Um, it should feel like it is tangible, but it's fake. Uh, yeah, Mysterious, that's a good idea. Um, let me think. Uh, other ways that I would describe I have a place in that case is um, taking a look at the materials used. Um, if it's a lot of metallic stuff, or if it's more plastic manufactory stuff, uh, then I would def those that would be what I would be using in those cases. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay, do we got any other questions from the chat? I'm not seeing any hands. I think okay. we're safe for doing it. Okay. The next thing that I want to go into uh, is fight scenes. So, in terms of fight scenes, there are a few things that you can go into. There are the broad scale battles. There are the um, uh, small scale duels. There are a whole lot of different things that you can use in terms of um, building up a fight or describing a fight in the middle of it. When you're describing a fight, it also matters what kind of perspective you're in. Are you in a third-person omniscient or a third-person limited? Because those two things make a big difference. When you're in a third person limited, at that point, you, you need to um, be very much in the head of the individual in the muck, in the trenches, or as they're fighting against an antagonist. If it's a broader bird's eye view, you need to give a very clear idea of the troops while also focusing in on the main character of the fight. Um, whether it's in a soldier who's caught up in the middle of things, or if it's a commander trying to f piece together bits and pieces of information, you need to be figuring out, okay, how who's the character whose perspective I'm in, what kind of perspective should I be using, and how am I going to impart information from both sides? Or do I even want to do both sides? Do I want to do just one side of the fight versus another side of the fight. So one idea with a duel, I'm actually going to uh, pull up an example from one of my own books. Uh, let me pull that up really quick and then put that. Uh, Venom, would you be willing to, um, so, in this case, uh, I'm just going to give a little bit of setup. This is from the first chapter of a um, book that I'm working on called Lords of Eternal Night. 
And uh, to this point, I'm not going to go into the prerequisites of a fight or the negotiations that take place. I'm just going to uh, take a look at the fight itself and how it's described. Uh, one second. Let me just cut and paste. Um, just how I describe the fight itself. So if you could read that Venom for me, that would be great. And I'll just uh, keep posting little bits and pieces. And uh, to have... Okay. Uh, so for some context, it's a man and a woman who are fighting. One of the... the one is using a sword, the other is using a mace, but both have magical enhancements using the rings that they've they using a set of rings that they have a ring that they have so if you want to just uh, describe read that for me i can use that as a jumping off point to kind of describe stuff okay uh, <clears throat> she transformed into a bar of green and black smoke and shot toward him shot paralyzed Kamul for an instant just as she solidified into a solid woman. Sword swinging toward his side. Without thinking Kamul lashed out with his armored fist. His arm moved faster than he thought possible. Gauntlet smashing into his opponent's collarbone. Just under her neck. Cloak flapping around her. Farah tumbled away and came up on one knee. With a hiss she stood up. Sword still clutched in her hand. Kamul clenched his fist. He had to try throwing her off. Remembering what he'd done with the others, he gathered his will into himself, then shoved it outward, visualizing a wave of power. Without thinking, his arm moved down and slammed his fist into the ground. With a roar, a wide circle of force expanded outward from him, slamming into his opponent with a loud crack. Farah stumbled back, then she shot forward, turning into mist. By, but this time, Kamul could see her trajectory before her blade could strike him. Hand moving automatically, Kamul deflected her sword with his mace, then swung his fist at her face. Flinching backward, she slashed at him, trying to evade him, but the power of the ring flowed through him, spurring him forward. All right. He pressed his advantage, swinging his mace at her with relentless fury. Frequently, she tried to escape from him, only to have his mace break the ground right in front of her. Growling, Kamul tried to exercise his will to pull her toward him, but he couldn't grasp onto her. She's fast, he thought, as he tried to land another strike. This time, instead of evading, she swung her blade to meet his mace. With a grin, Kamul put an extra bit of strength into his arm, fully expecting to knock it aside, but didn't. With a loud clang, the sword struck the mace's haft and stopped it dead in its tracks. Kamul's shock momentarily paralyzed him. That was all Farah needed. Now that she knew she could stop his swings, her speed turned from evasion to full frontal attack. Grasping his weapon in both hands, Kamul deflected strike after strike on his gauntlet or on the half of his mace. Growling, he swung at her, but she blocked his attack easily and started smashing her sword against his weapon hard enough to send out shockwaves of power. Desperately, Kamul drew more heavily on the power of his ring until he could predict where her sir, excuse me, sword was going to land. However, as he moved to block one strike, the future image shifted in a split second. Not thinking, Kamul blocked one, then the other, then swung at her head only to have her block it. Breath coming more rapidly, Kamul started falling into the pattern of stroke and counterstroke, back and forth between the wall and the camp. The two mighty warriors struggled, mace bashing against sword with loud clangs. Over and over, he slammed his mace against her sword, and over and over, she blocked him and then counterattacked with just as much force as he was directing at her. Excuse me. She's strong, he thought, with a grunt as she blocked one of his attacks and then slammed her blade against his breastplate, knocking him backward a few steps. She's just as strong as I am, he thought, as he blocked her backswing and tried to catch her with the return strike only to have her parry the attack with enough force to knock the weapon aside for an instant. He clearly knew how to use this power better than he did. He was relying on his fighter's instinct to keep ahead of her, and with his ring enhancing his abilities, Kamul was keeping her at bay, 
Strangely enough, he found that he was enjoying this. He liked the challenge of getting to fight such a skilled opponent. Whenever he'd fought swordsmen before, he'd been able to use the power of his mace to overwhelm his opponents, but against someone who had a ring, he was a peer rather than a superior. Yeah, I think that we'll stop there, but the main things that I want to kind of contrast with this is when you're just doing an individual fight, you want to very much go into the character's individual style. Like, for instance, in this case, we're dealing with a sword versus a mace. Now, a mace is a weapon that you can't really... You can use with a relatively... Like, you can do it with amount of skill, but there you're very much focusing on the momentum and you're trying to land a hit and you're trying to hit as hard as you can. With a sword, you're trying to move around your opponent, trying to get it into the armor, stuff like that. With a fight, you're trying... You can also evoke, use the character stuff we've focused on, where you can take an individual's character stuff and put it into their fighting style and use that to complement the fight. Like, for instance, Farah is not using a strength style initially um, until she figures out her opponent, and then from there she combines her skill with strength when she figures out her opponent's weaknesses, whereas Kamul is using strength from the off. So. That's kind of an example of a big, um, like a kind of one-on-one -on -one duel type situation. If we're doing a bigger style, uh, this this one I will read off. Uh, I'm just going to pull up um, my book, uh, Battle of the Seven Sons. With Battle of the Seven Sons, what I wanted to do was very much get into the nitty-gritty of a battle. and in this case, I'm more focusing on a single character as opposed to a larger scale um, pieces of the battle because I'm not in an omniscient narrator perspective, so to speak. So, um, let me see. So, in this place, this is just a section of a battle where I'm focusing in on a single person's perspective as they're um, in the middle of a a fight where the where people are coming in from two sides, so Analdar and his fellow elven archers tried to bombard the enemy over their shield wall, but the orcs had created a porcupine formation and began pushing into them, using their spears to skewer the elves in front, only to have their tips hacked off, blood soaked ground littered with fallen spear tips. They were quickly run out of arrows, however, which meant that it would come down to pushing spirits and blade work. So in this case, what we're seeing is that I am trying to both describe the setting of the battle as well as the battle itself and the um, progression of what's happening. Now that we kind of have that established, what I want to get into is the character perspective. Grimacing and apprehension, and Aldar watched as the enemy began discarding the ruined spears and through cleavers and scimitars as well as brutal and elegantly made weapons of war like axes and maces. Or fired a couple of another pair of arrows, then brought his hand to his side to pull out another one, only to find he'd used his last one seconds before. Without hesitation, Analdar pulled his spear from where he'd stuck it into the ground and picked up his shield. The other elves who rent and out of arrows began linking their shields and strengthening the already formed shield wall. The other one, the ones with fewer arrows, passing what they had to the archers in the back to allow them to maintain barraging the orcs. Eventually, though, they had formed a porcupine formation several ranks deep, just as a bang of arrows came down among the elves. The formation they'd been forced to adopt prevented them from, from forming a complete wall of steel while keeping their spears out. The arrow shafts cut down several elves in the center before a few managed to duck down and cover themselves with their upright ar his arms. And Aldar saw a few of his friends fall all before a few of the middle ranks managed to put shields up as cursory protection. Hold strong, and Aldar heard one of the officers shout. We need to hold until the Sathar arrive. We're going to die before that happens. And Aldar thought, as a horde of orcs charged toward him, a wave of steel-clad monsters with weapons too heavy for an elf, a human or an elf, to wield. He glanced toward the side, but he couldn't make out anything with the packed actoring spells in his way. One thing was clear, mounted calls were far in the far distance, nowhere close to him. They were on their own. 
Um, let me see. I think that's the main thing. Um, before, uh, and eventually the line breaks and the uh, orcs press in. And this is what happens when that ha when the orcs break through. Eyes wide on all their stared around, waiting, looking for an escape. He pushes his way back, elves falling behind him as he fled. His head flailed, vision darting around. Finally, he caught sight of a center slice action of the enemy formation just in front of him. If we hit that, we can make a run for our allies' lines. He thought maybe a few of his comrades could live. Before he could yell out to his friends to make the attempt, Thorash and the other orc cut through the few elves between him and certain death. The big pale one with the T-bar sword came at him, saying spared in a terrible grin. Unable to think of another option, and Aldar swung his sword at his attacker, trying to back, make him back off, but the orc just smashed his blade aside with his bracer. And Aldar tried to bring his sword up, but the brute smacked it aside, this time with his sword. Then the sword came down like a sunk thunderbolt. It was almost a gentle relief when the sword came down on his shoulder and sheared right through him. Sure. Uh, what's your question? So when we're talking about describing fight scenes, do you think the two main types will have to worry about describing, depending on what we're writing? Uh, do you think they'll be between one-on-one -on -one and full-scale war, or do you think there's something in between? I would say that um, in terms of it's either usually either single or uh, one side combatant or multiple combatants. That's kind of how I would break it down. Not necessarily like full scale war or one on one. I would kind of since my thought is since ultimately whenever you watch something or read something, it's either a duel or group on group. The size of each group, that's the variant part. Um, and you need to figure out the group on group bit. If it's a skirmish, um, it's going to be have less chaos and there's going to be less moving pieces than a bigger battle. And oftentimes there will be battles in between, in side of smaller battles inside of a bigger battle. Uh, think the Battle of Shallons, where uh, that, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, let me see. There was a book called Attila the Scourge of God. I want to make sure that I'm... Uh, yeah. Uh, let me see. Attila the, the Scourge of God by Ross Laidlaw. It goes into great detail about each of the individual sections of the Battle of Shallans and describes a character within the battle um, at multiple points to try and get you into the battle as it exists um so a lot of it also focuses around and around what are the technology levels of your of the forces fighting are we dealing with um high level technology versus low level technology or are they commensurate are they just different types what are the different fighting styles it all comes down to uh what's the scale who are the combatants what and what type of characters are you going to put into the battle so that you can have multiple different uh, perspectives? Are you going to do um, a general over the field? Uh, are you going to do who's kind of directs it via a Caesar type situation? Are you going to do use an Alexander the Great model where he is charging in along with his troops? Uh, same with um, uh, Attila the Hun did something similar. Uh, another example might be um, are you going to use a person on the ground, so to speak, who's in the middle of the fighting? Um, does a lot of it is kind of figuring out the individual pieces of how it shakes up. Does, does that answer your question, or was that a little bit too long-winded? Oh, no, it answers my question, um, because you noted in your answer that there could be something in between other than one-on-one -on -one confrontation in full-scale war you could have one person against multiple assailants or something mm -hmm. in between like uh you know instead of full-scale mm -hmm. war you could just have a gang war uh, 5v5 mm -hmm. or something like that like you said a skirmish mm -hmm. yeah um black is king had a question so i'll uh, bring him in really quick uh what was your question <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Venom. It's not you. But when you mentioned, like, you know, one versus five, I was immediately thinking about, like, well, maybe you could use Galadriel's scene from Rings of Power for... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm, sorry. Fire. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had to do. I had to do it. I'm sorry. I'm that, sorry. You do that, Kill Bill or like Bruce Lee or something? Uh, nah. Like, <laughs> let's not no, that, no, no. That 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 actually is a great version. I mean, one woman versus quote eighty nine or ninety eight crazy oh God, like trained man. warriors. That's insane. That is insane. Kill Bill really had it on that. I mean, that's a good example of a great series of fight scenes. Um. One thing I wanted to ask, and it's it's Thanks not so much of mood, man. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to do it. I'm sorry. If you want to blame anyone, blame Ritter. Oh, uh, but um, actually, this <laughs> question is here. um, you can't use him as a scapegoat. Okay, fine. Blame Monkey Con. Uh, I, I, mean, I mean, no offense. I mean, he's not replying out loud, so technically he can't even defend himself. So we blame him. But well, first things first. Well, we can use um, this. But one thing about fighting yeah, scenes, which is something I'm trying to work on, because um, they were helping me with a document um, on Friday, and it was leading into a fight scene. And I know that in fight scenes, choreography is something. And I noticed in your version, you do a good job of, like, how the battle scenes go. And it seems like it goes into, like, you know, like a kind of correspondence with an actual fight. Like, someone swings with a sword, a person blocks with a maze. Someone uses this to like counter that, then that person I'm either glad takes you pointed it that out. Um, so one thing I was gonna ask you about fight scenes, especially because this fight scene I'm doing is in a book with a bunch of kids and everything, but it's still balanced in a way because of magic. Um, it's going to be three on one, the one being a giant monster. So if I was say fighting a giant slime. What would be some key notes to take on if I was hitting it with blunt objects or like or like magical attacks? Ooh, so slime, describe a little bit more for me. Are you talking All about right. it's um gelatinous a gelatinous yeah, yes, cube? Yes, yes. Like a, a giant a giant um a giant fourteen foot tall monster about twenty feet wide. Um it's able to spread its body and like even divide itself but it doesn't do it automatically it just does after a long period of time yeah no 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 that's kind of the whole point um venom it's like any fight scene is attack react or attack defend or defend against a series of oncoming attacks etc 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 it's like there I mean, is yeah no but you you put it into perspective by saying that like i never thought of it that way like now i'm gonna go into writing fight scenes with a with a with a different perspective other than just me winging it i could well, actually think about well, the cause and effect of each character's action instead of just going well off, uh, well you just content. said something that actually is perfect for that i mean you're the one who mentioned the crazy 88 from kill bill or maybe that was me i don't remember but yeah. um but it's like the point though is that right there is a huge situation to choreographize. And even for the singular moments of fighting that are there or quote small comedy that might be, it's like you have to, it's like if you were to write out like say 20 seconds of that scene when it all starts, it's like automatically if you could find a way to write all of that out like in a way that describes like um the brides like sword strike from her the um what's her name second in command straight to the first like 10 warriors you automatically have an understanding of how this fight would have taken place now it will depend depending on if you use first person or second i'm sorry first person or third person style but um yeah about the question with the slime what should i probably focus on when it comes to action or reaction if you're speaking venom your voice is soft I think it might be uh, the speaking. recording. Oh. It might be the recording playing through his microphone. That might be it. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, that's just my theory. So, uh, in terms of the slime, what I would describe with that one is I would definitely um, describe how the slime moves and how that affects the characters and why that is danger. And I would also. Uh, 
take a look at um, the individual characters with um, uh, how their we their each individual weapon. Um, I would if take a look, I would also take a look at um, what's the durability of the gelatinous adversary. Um, uh huh. Um, your, um, I want to weigh in so bad, but I don't want to interrupt yeah, you. For... No, I'm, uh, I, I just have one thought. Like, if, say, you're using, like, blunt weapons, uh, I would say, uh, just describing how the weapons interact with the slime and how, uh, uh, viscous the slime is. That's the main thing. Uh, you go ahead and go for it. Okay, so when you describe this, uh, and I did read, you, you presented it uh, uh, Friday, so I know what you're talking about. Um, you describe this, this uh, giant slime monster as this kind of siege level creature because it's so massive, right? So it's going to be treated a lot less like an adversary and a lot more like a, like a natural disaster or, or an event. So um, <laughs> what, what well, Dunn goes into is like... Go ahead. No, I was going to say, um, honestly, that was one of the things we were talking about that evening was the fact that I had gotten into quote-unquote, what I hate the most, the backstory and the jutsu concept of um, what I was trying to get at. Because I was initially trying to describe the slime, but then I ended up going all the way back to them, like, noting about, like, all about them going through the gates to go see them, and blah, 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 blah. I didn't even get to describe him. Like, technically, I, I just mentioned him being a monster that Melvin really didn't want to use because he was the top tier of the Bronze Blade at Dragon Quest IV. Well, one of the top tiers. Well, here's and the here's the beauty about that, though, Black. You can describe the monster. Um, you can describe it with his actions because it's affecting the environment directly. And like, when slimes interact with the environment, they, they leave traces of themselves behind. Um, if someone were to, let's say split it in half think about what would happen right like would it be two slime monsters now or like what th see you get to play with the idea of how the creature behaves based upon how they the uh, hero is resisted because you you're treating it as if it's like this natural disaster so you don't necessarily have to stop the confrontation to describe the creature you can use what uh, you can use details about the destruction it causes or what kind of traces it leaves behind to describe it. Like, what if it leaves giant pools of slime everywhere? You can describe the color of what uh, what it's leaving behind. You can describe its level of durability and wh how what the, like what Dunn was saying, like how the weapons affect the creature. And, like, you don't have to go into description directly. You can do it in other ways, especially with how you have it set up. No, no, that's kind of one reason why I was asking because, um, like, when he was describing the fight between the wind user who has a sword versus the one with the mace and her magical shift into everything, I was saying, wow, okay, so not only is her reaction, like, you know, using the mace, but it's also changing her body. So she's changing her entire signal tree to fight this person who, while a skilled fighter in his own right, is not a, quote, master of the world. He's told he can take himself up here. He's not at that level. And that by itself is just saying like, okay, wow. So this guy, he's doing well, but he's doing well in a joke way even now because of his natural born skills and his ability to know like, you know, fight in general. Um and, and then I'm thinking to myself, you know, apart from this being just a relationship of like, you know, like, you know, one person fighting against somebody who's just a really threatening individual, but could also it could also be taken the other way either. I was thinking about that in the regards of when he went over into the siege situation with the elven orcs. I was like, okay, so when you have a group of people, it's like the approach to it is very like, 
by group single exposure concentration. Now, if you have one group of L uh, cores making a pulse response formation, but it's like that one formation is the same thing, the same that you know affects the next group. And then you have one individual who's clouding up something else. You could just get to this area and blah 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 blah. You could do this. So you could just see how this person's going to either lead or be a point of leading to this next group. And it's just like wow. It's like uh, it's like you could see all these concepts coming together. And I and a part of me is also feeling like when I saw when I thought about that, I also saw how in a way like in a way how that kind of also proves it in the sense if you were just fighting like instead of an army just one big opponent which is one reason why I brought up the whole giant slime thing too because I mean having to use multiple like magical attacks or something to fight one enemy while another group does this or another or the other two do this it, it does it does feel like you know laying siege on something and, and it is it's very visually And the other thing which you just answered, so I just want to see how far you want to move on. Yeah, uh, if you want to look at my stuff, uh, the link, uh, I just sent you the link um, uh, for my 16 bucks. So, um, so you can basically pick your particular letter of what you are wanting to go for. So, of my books, The Lost Legion is the most highly reviewed. Um, then there's um, War of a Thousand Kings, which is the sequel. Uh, uh, you know, well, thank you. Um, I'm going to move you down. Uh, oh, oh, I did move you. Sorry. Uh, I do have a question. Okay, go for it, Kate. So, for my story, I'm trying to write a scene with gladiators fighting a monster, like a very genetically modified monster, and how would you best describe, like, a attack of this monster? Let's just say it's on mostly four, you know, it's on fours. It uh, has like razor sharp teeth and stuff. Like, how would you describe a lot of its attacks? I, I, I can't fully describe that at the moment, but it's roughly. Okay. Okay. Uh, so in terms of how I would describe an animal that's mostly on all fours, what I would first describe is how. Well, first I go with how it looks. Then, as it moves closer, I would describe size compared to the um uh the gladiators and what kind of emotion that derives from that if it's from a character in the perspective of the arena if it's for somebody in the aught i would have them kind of have an emotional reaction of oh they deserve it or um and so they're kind of judging the animal as judging the animal in some way as either a good opponent or a bad opponent. I'm imagining that it's a good opponent and that it's a formidable thing. When uh, the animal moves in, what I would describe is, is you figure out, okay, what kind of natural weapons is it likely to use? Um, I guess my immediate um, picture in my head, this could be totally wrong, but uh, I immediately picture a uh, immediately picture this um, Belladier Sovereign um, Sovereign this kind of like just something that's a big animal, like kind of lion-esque and what I would kind of imagine that an animal would do initially is try to feign an attack and then go in from the side or try to focus in on a um, 
the weakest opponent. It also really depends on the size as well. If you have mm -hmm. a, an adversary of a large size, it's going to want to try and use its size to its advantage. If it's an Aquarius face versus a... Uh, it's a large one. Okay, it's a large one. And are we talking aquatic based or land based? Or land based. Land based? Okay. So in that case, it's going to be basically using its four paws a lot. Um, because, and it's going to probably try and use leaping at the enemy in order to get it. And there's one thing I want to mention. This creature, there's a plot twist that it can walk on its, uh, on two feet, but it chooses to hide that away because it's kind of intelligent. It doesn't show all its cards, but it can walk on two feet. Okay. Okay. But it doesn't show, it's very intelligent. It doesn't show all its weaknesses or all its skills. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. So essentially you want to be from the animal's perspective then, is that correct? Uh, just for writing it, yeah. Okay, um. so in that case it would be thinking in very animalistic terms, like um, Robert Jordan uses this technique in The Wheel of Time where when he writes from the perspective of wolves, or he has the characters talking with wolves and sharing their perspective, the wolves come up with imagery like um, for magic users they go with uh, people who catch the wind and throw fire. Um, or two legs, or for humans, hard-footed four legs, or Wait. horses, or... Wait, hang on. Okay, go for it. What's up? Yeah. Cats, I thought you were writing about the creature from the perspective of the gladiators. I am, but I just want to see different perspectives, just, just so I could answer the writing. Just, I want to hear it. Okay. That's okay, oh, okay, of course. Okay. Yeah, no worries. So in terms of that, what I would do is, um, if it's from the perspective of the gladiators, I would definitely describe their reactions. And if you have intent for the animal, do you intend for the animal to win or for the animal to lose? What's the mostly win. Win. Okay. So if you want to have it win then I would definitely just show how outclassed these guys are by how fast the animal goes and how strong it is. And I could just use it and just describe using its uh, fangs and claws, uh, whichever kind of animal it might be. Its natural weaponry, I would say. With... Uh, it, it would also work if you figure out a specific kind of way that your animal moves and how um, kind of it interacts with its surroundings. The way I visualize it is kind of like a jaguar. Like, it's, like, very sneaky. Like, it moves very carefully, like, almost calculated. Like, it almost calculates each move it makes in a way. Like, like the way the best way I could picture it is a jaguar trying to sneak up a prey, but isn't out broad light so it's not most ad you know it's not it doesn't have the best advantage but it's still able to adapt to the situation even though it prefers to sneak on it it could still adapt to it so what's the surrounding we're looking at in terms of oh, it's a gladiator way? sandy completely no terrain just sand uh flat terrain because it's a gladiator field okay so one uh, kind of example I'm thinking, if we're using cats as an example, uh, I closed the stream intentionally, uh, I would study, uh, if you're using cats, uh, have you seen the movie Tarzan, uh, the animated one? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to pull this example up really quickly um, uh, as example of how you can use animal movements very easily. I'm just going to mute it and then just click right here. So you just go with the cat is moving extremely quickly. It's not moving in a straight line. Um, and you want to have it try and leaping, leaping at its opponent 
as well as moving very fast, trying to use quick movements. You also want it to be attacking the weak points like the neck and the uh, arms or going for the hamstrings. Um, in terms of, oh, usually wolves will go for hamstrings, cats will usually go for the neck since cats have longer teeth and their canines usually are built to go for jugulars. Uh, like for instance with this moment right here, we see, you can actually put this very easy on page, where I'm actually going to slow this down to about 1.25 speed right here. So let me see, get this to the right point. So we see the animal, it goes goes to the side, making you think that its prey is going to go. It's going to go that way. But in reality, it shifts and goes high, jumps over, over, goes goes low, low, and just goes for a very full frontal attack type situation. And really, this is slightly dramatized for the sake of a film, but. Um, I would say that it does this uh, work as something that's helpful for trying to describe or working out how to describe yeah. something or okay that's that's definitely the approach I'm trying to go with my creatures so thank you yeah uh, another thing is also um, if you're in the perspective of the gladiators I would definitely have each individual um, person be thinking of uh, looking at the creature and what their reaction is as it kills them, if uh, that's your intention for the creature to win. Um, definitely build up the fear that they're experiencing of what they're uh, going through when facing this animal. Alright. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, any other questions before we move into kind of scenes in general? Uh, we've been talking for quite a while. This has been great. Uh, uh, but just wanted to make sure there weren't any uh, last minute questions that uh, we need to answer. And for me, I'm like, I'm a very visual person, so when I have a visual that I can base my character off of, it really helps. Uh, let me actually show you something. I actually have a, a Pinterest board. Um, uh, okay, Black is King, go for it. Uh, one, for it. Uh, while I'm pulling that up. Yeah, I, I'm so sorry. Um, this is less about scene related, but it's more about your book related. Um, okay. So I, I might have to step away later on, so I don't want to miss the opportunity if I could. Um, you mentioned one of your books was the Morph Review, and what was that book again? Uh, that would be the Lost Legion. Um. Yeah, that, that one's got the most uh, reviews. It's got about 50 reviews on Amazon. It's got four out of five. Right, and 10 so. years up to, 10 years and over the years. Okay. And um, the last question I had in regards to that was, um, you did something called, you said you did something called Dragon Blaster Season 1. Mm-hmm. Yep. Is that, you said that, that was a kid-related book? Uh, it's not really kid related so as so much as I it's a satire of Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, let me actually pull up. This is the original title, but basically what I did with this was I um I just took a lot of uh, imagery from a lot of uh, Saturday morning cartoons as well as concepts like the six man band, uh, the characters in um kind of the character models, the kind of corny setup, the infinite unit spam that uh, for the bad guys, um, bad guys coming out with uh, new technology in order to beat the, beat the heroes in an abnormal way, the kids trying to meet, bounce off of each other, figure out uh, how, they, how they gel together as people. Um, as well as trying to figure out like how to accessorize the uh, people. Um, so one thing that I actually used was Pinterest, where I took a bunch of ideas from various different animated shows, put them into a whole folder, and then I can use that to mix and match battle gear. 
another thing that I did was take a bunch of different uh, related but not quite the same dragon images from a bunch of uh, animated shows and use those as my models that I can use to describe uh, the various different dragon models and dragons in the book. book. Um, that way I have a consistent frame of reference where I don't get mixed up or accidentally use the wrong description. Does that make sense? It does, it does. Um, yeah, I was just looking to see which one I can get my hands on, and um, I was curious about the kid one because... Um, um, it's not necessarily I, for kids. Um, there's bleeped out swear words, and there's at least a good amount of, like, pretty... Well, um, what would you call like, him? What's his special thing called again? It's something about lying or something like that. Now, it's not that it's about the kid thing. It's just that I know you mentioned Saturday morning cartoon the first time, and a part of me did want to kind of like, um, ask about that. And 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 I'm only just saying this because, like I said, I might have to bounce a little bit, unfortunately. Um, but uh, hey. I did want to know because um, finding good kid books are hard nowadays because a lot of them are in close pressing and a lot of them are very um a lot of them are based off of very um kind of like overcoming you know your want to say feelings or or um your personal like 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 situations as far as like your health or something and becoming a quote better person a lot of stories i mean i'm not saying that there's any there's nothing wrong with that it's just that it just feels like a lot of stories are kind of moving away past the kind of like saturday morning adventure kind of vibe that some books used to have or even some of the misty vibe books used to have so i was going to ask like if dragon black was kind of related to that and if you could give any hints or something because um i am definitely intrigued to get my hands on it Okay, so Dragon Blaster is uh, published. Um, it is currently on about $3.43 if you have time. Uh, otherwise, it's 9 bucks. But basically, the book is, yes, it's multi-person perspective. I actually really don't like writing in first person um, since it, I just feel really constricted and just want to get out if I am stuck in one character perspective, so I try to bounce around between multiple people. There's also, with Dragon Blaster, there's the gimmick of the, of a snarky omniscient narrator who interjects at certain points in time just to um, uh, make fun of what's happening. Right, well, thank you for that answer. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. All right. Um... Yeah, hopefully, yeah, um, I think, uh, if that's all, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to move into the, um, scene type. So, um, this is kind of a simplified thing, but for me, when I look at the individual kinds of scenes that I've encountered. There's romance, conflict, drama, or dialogue. So one thing you need to do with, and each one requires a different kind of evocative imagery. When you have a dialogue scene, it is very easy to often get focus so focused in on the characters talking that you forget to describe either what they're doing or what they're thinking or uh, other things that may come up. So with a dialogue scene, in order to build evocative imagery, what you need to do is make sure that at certain points you have maybe not even like a long paragraph, maybe a couple like two or three sentences where you describe what the character does and it also include bits of what the character is thinking. Because when you talk about what the character is thinking, you get to um, uh, 
of get an idea of, okay, what are they focused on? Are they per focused on the person's body language? Are they focused on the person's uh, attributes as opposed to what they're saying? A lot of that is focused around, you got to figure out the balance between how much is being said in the dialogue versus how much you are um, illustrating uh, of the scene around it that will inform the dialogue, like body language, uh, playing with clothes, what kind of clothes they're wearing to the discussion, what kind of discussion is it? Is it fraught with tension? Is it um, a more laid back? Is it a meeting of friends, etc.? With a drama scene um, where uh, I use this one as an example of John Snow and New Grit from A Song of Ice and Fire, where John is debating whether or not to kill Egret. Uh, you're very much in John's head. You make sure when time. Sorry, had to trim my nose. I apologize. But. You're in his head, and you got to very quickly both describe the scene around him, but also you mainly want to be in his head, having his memories flash before him. You want to have a his conflict very clear to the fore versus a um, something more dialogue-heavy. And that's kind of how you can do that. With a romance scene, uh, you very much want to get into the mindset of what does each character like about the other, what their body language is, what the character is feeling, and what they're seeing, maybe even smelling. But a lot of it is based around, okay, we need to... Uh, put ourselves in the frame of reference of the character and figure out, okay, what are they attracted to? What do they like about the other person? What is What are they kind of feeling? Is this a romance situation that elevates the romance? Is it something that um, decreases the romantic feeling? Is there a misunderstanding? Is there um, a, a breaking of trust? Uh, is there a... Um, uh, tension put on it from exterior forces, uh, and all those can be established through evoking that imagery and that um, uh, the feelings inside of the person. Um, we especially in, in a romance scene, especially the sole focus needs to be on the object of the romance, where if it's say a girl and she likes a guy you need to be, and it's primarily from the girl's perspective, most of everything else in the room is going to go away and it's going to be solely focused on the object of the affection. And uh, uh, if you want to um, raise your hand, uh, I'm totally happy to take some questions. Questions in between, uh, if you have something pertinent to say. Uh, yeah. Um, what I was going to ask is, how can we relate uh, scene setting to how we set up a uh, sorry, yeah, how do we relate scenes to uh, relating it to the setting? Like, what kind of subtext can we put in certain scenes to let the reader know what time period or what kind of story mm -hmm. they should expect? Okay, that's a good question. I would say in that case, um, I would look to something like Stormlight Archive, the prologue. Because in the prologue of, a, of Stormlight Archive, you are thrown into an alien, a completely alien world. It is not like anything you have ever seen. So what they immediately need to get across, Brandon Sanderson gets across, is that Everybody lives in stone houses. They are living in constructions of cities that are in deep in on the um, kind of circular areas of, of 
uh, lays in the ground to keep from being destroyed by storms. They use gem gemstones infused with a substance called stormlight in order to light things and, and as well as describing the clothing and the technology level of the individual characters. Uh, and especially in the scene of Stormlight, he's able. There are a lot of people who are there, so Brandon Sanderson can describe. Okay, these people don't quite look uh, like us. Some of them have kind of darkish skin with very white eyebrows, or this person is a bald shin man, uh, who or bald man from Shinovar, who has who looks almost childlike by comparison to the more darker skin of the people around him. Uh, so uh, a big part of it is I liken it to film in a way where you need to have an establishing shot and in the setting. And a big sometimes that works in a big omniscient shot down Though also you can do an in-the-character perspective where they're looking around and describing what they're seeing. Um, and you can even have the character's eyes just be caught by little bits and pieces of detail. And that can also both uh, tell you about the character, but also about the setting, where you see, okay, they're interested in this, that's, therefore their eye is caught by this. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay. Uh, let me see other things involving set scene. Um, I definitely you want to make sure that you understand what kind of perspective you're using. If you're using, say, a limited perspective, um, definitely be describing what's going on in the scene in terms of the uh, people in the room, how many people are there, what their disposition is and their and the room around them um there's actually a piece of uh let me pull up prince um let me just pull let me just pull up the scene uh where i'm using a lot of different let me actually see. I don't believe that I used a lot of setting description, but I used a lot of uh, character description. Let me see. Uh, so, um, let me pull, let me just find it really quick. So the idea is that, um, You want to talk about how, um, say, you're in the bit, middle of a great hall of essential key. When you talk about that, you are immediately in the mind of, okay, this is a medieval style fantasy. And um, talk about their, the nobility, um, the, even talk about uh, character interactions where maybe some people are um uh, uh happy with the current power dynamic whereas other people are not happy with the power dynamic and how their body language reflects that other thing that you can use is um um how some characters react to certain uh stimuli where like uh, if the light in the area is bright or if it's not very dark or it's very dark. Um, there's also um, kind of characters be thinking about uh, certain bits of the scenery. Like uh, one example is a character who is thinking about uh, the sword that his dad has and thinking how describing the sword but also describing whether his dad is worthy or unworthy to use it. And that both tells you about 
the character of the father and of the son. If the son is dismissive of his dad, you get an idea of his character and uh, his flaws as a character, whether he whether his dad is a good a ruler or not, or and even in some cases you can root agree with the prince that that person isn't worthy, whether they're pathetic, they're or they're venal or a bad person. Um, and you can also get what, an idea. What does of, venal mean? Uh, venal is a word that means petty. Petty means to. Uh, so denoting a sin that is not. Re okay, so it's kind of. Uh, venal, venal. Okay, let me see. So venal. Okay, so it's of uh, a. Okay, so it means a uh, denoting a sin that is not regarded as depriving the soul of divine grace. So, i.e., something quite unforgivable. Um, kind of, um, like petty or um, malicious. Um. That sort of thing. Do, does that uh, does that make sense? It does. Oh, we have a question uh, from Black. Okay. Sure. All right. All right, Black. Go for it. Hey, hey, hey. So, because I didn't want to leave without um asking this these last two things. So, um, there was something I was trying to do in last week's um writing class, and it was trying to express character through dialogue, and. I unfortunately I'm a very weird person because I don't really have a bit of conflict or interest or place when I speak to people, and I try to usually like work things out. But I have a character in two books that are ideal, where one is an orphan, and he gets adopted, but he's like thrice burned by life, so he's always on the edge. And the other character is a kid who quote unquote feels betrayed because of a situation and now finds himself in a school where he quote is doing well, but he has to work on it too. And it's something he doesn't want to do. But mm. um so both characters I would say are dealing with a bit of like a what's that word? Bag a bit of baggage when it comes to like feeling as well um one second. Feeling, um, one is dealing with feeling, um, I think when, when you feel like, you know, like, one of the, like, a, I don't want to say abandonment issues, but like, you know, a feeling like when you find a character and they're like, they've been through a lot because of both themselves, but mostly because other people don't want to be bothered. I'm trying to find a word for that. Yeah. Um, um. It sounds like it, but that, that's mostly the one that starts off with the last, with the other one, because he has to work on the team, but his main issue is trust issues, because this is, it's like he's not only in a different environment, but he's dealing with, um, he's also dealing with, like, everybody has their own agenda, and everybody's nobody is going to be forced to like with everything, so, uh. so he's like, Reticence, so you know. Reticence, reticence, reticence. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Uh, reticent means unwilling to give information or interact. Oh, reticent. And not revealing uh one's thoughts or feelings readily. So that's one word that you can use. Um, reluctant is another way of putting that. Yeah, good yeah, point. I agree. Yeah, I agree with that. So, um, I, I guess what I was asking was because I had set them up in a, I had set up one of them in a situation where he was speaking to his team, and it's like I was trying to make him come off as snarky and kind of like dismissive, but I also want to play it as the trope that even though he is quote snarky and dismissive. He does have this underlying thing where it's not like he's trying to get the two behaviors where he's killed, so he still has a certain level of, what's the word I'm looking for? 
when you're winning those local PGAs. It still has a certain level of longing. I guess you could say camaraderie. Camaraderie is a good description for that, yeah. Okay, so it's like, what are some things I should look into as far as like describing swimming fitness and things like that? So I actually have uh, something along those lines. I actually posted it in the chat. Uh, Black, if you want to read that, cut out uh, what I put in the chat starting with Sire. Mm -hmm. um, what you can do is just take a look at that and say, okay, how do the word choices and the actions of the character indicate what what kind of person yeah. they are. So if you could read that aloud for us, that would be great. Sure. Sire, Ryan bowed his rather symmetrical head. John returned with a grin. We have come with news of a rather bad one. We require a loan to a king to support our club. See, John said, stroking his beard. I don't know where my beard <laughs> Yo, he thought to himself. I see, John said, stroking his beard. How much do you require? Ten thousand pieces of silver, Kathleen said, a slightly smug smile on her face, token is your irritation, more than the demand. John nodded slowly. I will, that is the picture. Richard stood up, his crush behind his back to hide how furious he was. We have given enough already. Perhaps they should think to pay us with that silver they owe us. Is it not a hundred thousand more? I think it's high time that they paid back the debt. With what? John asked. They claim to have had a bad harvest. Should we not investigate that? Surely we should not give where there is no need? Richard's gaze into the round head's eyes, causing the man to stare back at him. Well, imagine if you wouldn't mind investigating your claim of a bad harvest. Surely this, Kathleen said. But Richard's eyes silenced. Ooh. Richard's eyes silenced them. Do you allow us to examine your land? Richard asked, passing his hands behind his back. I'm sure that we won't find bits of land burning or salty to conceal your roof. They drifted to his feet. He could bear and smell shade. Yep. John. Uh, Shade is a wolf. It's a big black wolf. Oh, 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 okay. Never mind, never mind. Uh, Ryan stood wavingly, eyes circling towards a large black wolf. We withdraw the request. Perhaps you will consider a way to repay the prince's generosity. Grom let out a guttural laugh. Guttural laugh. It seems as though the young wolf has fangs, he declared, and he is not afraid to use them. <laughs> Agreed, brother, Hatia remarked, eyes dancing with eager glee. It would appear that the roundhead head was made afraid by no more than a pair of unscented eyes of a young boy. I glimpsed at the rebuke, but he gave Richard a grin. Grin. Though his ire seemed less than his wife, calmly Richard kept his feet until he had departed the room. Then he resumed his seat at his father's side. The rest of the seating went as planned, until everyone but the wolf pack, everyone but the wolf pack as the family was called. Gone. Well caught, Richard, Skull remarked, folding his arms. Those old blood, blood, did they conceal what is rightfully ours under the guise of loan? We should help them, John said. They are robbing you, brother, Hatia said. John laughed. You are a complete if you think that they are telling the truth. You cannot speak to me like that, John said. I will at least look. If there is no salt or fire, I will demand payment. What you said last time, Grom remarked, and the time before that, and the time before that. They were persuasive in promising me that they would eventually repay the debt, John said briefly. We should do as our ancestors did, and do what needs to be done, Hatia remarked, folding her arms. My father in law is a man of war. Now we are at peace. I mean to heal the wounds that the Sepulchre left behind, John declared. We need to maintain the peace at any cost. I disagree, brother, Hatia began tapping her elbow with her finger. Clearly she was annoyed, but she hid it well. And Richard's father, at least, wanted to see that. 
the census book. The Savaris may be gone for now, but we've gotten fat and lean. And all we're doing is sniping at each other rather than actually doing something to improve our country, he remarked. We're at peace, Richard, John said, a slight amount of sadness entering his tone. We defeated the Safaris. They won't return for a long time. That attitude proves my point exactly, Richard glared, glared pointedly at his father. You, you've been allowed to grow weaker and weaker because my grandfather was a real, was a real man who drove those raiders back into the sea where they belong. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, take a minute. Everyone's eyes, everyone's jaws dropped. Are you sure it's all your father's fault? Father, do you realize you're speaking the truth in an offense, offensive thing, Richard shot back calmly? Father, I know you said it in book, said John. Richard, maybe you should be more respectful, said Richard respectfully. Richard sort of clasping his hands behind his back. I will not respect a man who seems to be trying his best to burn down our house and ignoring the blank, he said flatly. Now that he had the final word, Richard left the room. Damn. Okay, wow. Whew. Man. I love a smack when it comes, but damn. Damn, both smacked on the chin. Um, what were you highlighting by having him read that? The main thing I wanted to highlight is kind of what are the character interactions that you get from this? And what do the, how does the dialogue show you what kind of characters they are? So from what I've gathered so far, and you have something I want to ask you about after I, after I mention this. I noticed that Richard has a bit more firmness in his voice, and he has like this approach where it's where it seems like he is not to be not to be mocked in a way, and he's very very straightforward with his speech. And he's willing to kind of like even make it sound like there are certain things that'll happen if, you know, you don't, you know, allow, allow for, um, what you call it to happen. Like, if you don't, if you don't, like, you know, allow for, like, no. truth to come to light, it's like, you notice he's letting off subtle hints that, you know, there could be problems for your well-being. At least what I got from talking to the guys at the lab. No nonsense is the phrase you're looking for there. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. He has like a no-nonsense attitude. His sister, Haitia, on the other hand, is more of a... I don't know if it's the word is eager to fight. But there's something about the way she approaches things that's just... Like, she's just ready to get on it. And she and, and she's kind of like snarky, like willing to snark back at um. Well, the people who speak. Uh, one thing I will say though, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to scroll down and click on one button. Alright, so Ryan, I'm not sure if I focused too much on, on Ryan. Um, but I know that with Richard, he has the fire. Um, Haitia seems to be like she's eager to change and also has a certain serious approach to her, but she has a, I feel like a more. I don't want to say venomous approach to it, but I feel like she's going to be a bit more of a, a kind of person who will be quick to shoot first and ask questions later kind of approach to it. Um, and the real person that really caught my interest, though I kind of don't um, get, I think I think he is the pink. It's John, yeah? Mm-hmm. John, yeah. John is pink? Okay, John seems more timid or more reluctant to push things forward. And I believe it's because they are at peace. And, um, Yeah, it's kind of like what's his name from Game of Thrones, at least in the comic books. It's like, like he sounds, you know, kind of like butterballed and kind of like fat and lean over over an extended period of like a good time. But, um, yeah, um, damn. Dang, I mean, Richard really went into him. I mean, I haven't seen somebody smack like somebody like that in front of everybody, so that's... Oh boy, that's something. Um, I, I did have a question though, and it does relate to this because you do something, and 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 I've said this before. 
I don't know what this is called. Or maybe I might I don't make this the last one because he does have to continue the lesson. Yeah, I will. Um, I, I just I repasted something. I repasted something down into the um dialogue. Um, I'm sorry, into the into the chat box. So <laughs> usually, whenever I write a situation, I usually I usually do it in a way where it comes off as um it comes off as kind of like a separation after a dialogue. I just want to know if um if there was a quote if there was a quote right way to do something like this. I just posted. I'm sorry about that. I just posted this in the um in the um chat. Like a pause between dialogue is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I just posted it there. Um, it's kind of like when you mentioned um and that attitude proves my point exactly. Richard Greer pointed it at his father's gut. You've been allowed to grow weaker and weaker because my grandfather was a real man who drove his radar back into the sea where they belong. So, like, usually I notice people write a lot like this. Where it's like you open with dialogue, you go into, like, a, s a short exhibitional person just telling some of the person's stuff, and then you give more dialogue. For me, I've usually just done the approach where it's just dialogue and, like, character exposition, then I go to the next phrase and when the person responds, the person continues talking. And then it's like, you've always been allowed blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, it ends with a he belong, and then it ends there again. So, do you have to combine both lines of dialogue of a person speaking, or are you allowed, it, or are you permitted to skip a line or so, and, or just go straight into a single dialogue again with like the person finishing up their statements or that action, if that makes sense. So it's ultimately up to the writer, but for me, what I like doing is to, um, if I can, in between dialogue, I will put in, sometimes I'll do he said, she said, um, but if I'm trying to prove a point, what I'm specifically going to go for is, um, I'm going to take the opportunity in between the dialogue to rehook the reader by a uh, an action of the character, um, and especially if I want a break where I have the character doing something in between his sentences, I definitely want to have that there. Um, another example could be the. Um, like the character is just taking a sip of wine or a sip uh, when he drinks. Um, and that can show like either unconcern or you can even show um, uh, a character's uh, disposition by, by how their hand uh, is shaking either with fear or anger. And that's an example of what I like doing where kind of either before they speak in the paragraph or in between their sentences, that usually uh, helps me to kind of anchor myself in the scene as well as help the reader be anchored in the scene. That's uh, generally how I would, uh, would answer that question. It really ultimately depends. I on had two questions. Uh, shoot. Oh, shoot. Right. So uh, when you when he was talking about what techniques are allowed, per se, uh, whenever you're writing dialogue, uh, would you say that it's more important to prioritize techniques that make sure the reader knows who's speaking? I would say yes. Um, uh, I would definitely either use a very a clear descriptor of who's talking in the said, or um, a very clear, this is the person who's speaking right now type of thing. Um, because if you were to um, do something and they don't know who's talking, that creates some problems because it means that the reader can't fully um, uh, visualize what's happening in the scene. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Yeah, it does. It does. Um, my second question, how am I going to put this? So, which do you think is better? Um, do you think conveying the emotion of the character in narration is better, or do you think uh, having a character perform a certain gesture that implies their emotional state would be better for um, for the reader in, in, in the case of storytelling? I would definitely say that conveying to the reader um, the uh, storytelling is probably better um, in certain circumstances. Uh, the ones that I'm thinking of currently are if you have a point where a character is doing something, you're going to want to show their emotion. And generally it's better if the um, character does something and it's reflective of their character and their emotional state, especially if you're not in their head. Uh, that often allows you to get to the point where, oh, okay, so this is what the character is uh, thinking, this is what they're about, sort of thing. Does that make sense? Yes. So it really kind of depends, like, uh, if you're... Um, using a character's um, POV for, say, um, illustrating uh, that the other person is angry, you need to, sh it's good to show what the character is thinking um, so that the other person can, um, uh, so you can put the reader or right in the mind of the character. So if they're noticing it, that means, oh, okay, that means what they're thinking. That's what they're thinking. So that's kind of my thought on the, on this. Like, it really depends. Like, if it's not a major character, definitely I would say no. But if it is an important character, then yes, I would definitely do that. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I do think this has been extremely productive. I've very much enjoyed uh, this uh, particular conversation quite a bit. Oh yeah, I enjoyed your explanations too. Uh, they they gave me a couple more my arsenal as far as perspective especially during the fight scene um portion where you you basically yeah, I'm exactly you you basically put me in the mind of uh you know choreographing the scene you said visualizing it as if it was a movie um, I never did that in particular with fight scenes I gave me a new way of looking at it yeah go for it Sorry. Um, yeah. I definitely appreciate this because I w I'm, there are some parts of my writing I'm really struggling with and your presentation really helped me out a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course, of course. It was my pleasure. Yeah, Richard. Um, so most of the time, though, his hands are almost always behind his back. Is this because of the situation he's dealing with, or is it because of like trying to like hide frustration? So he's like he sees himself and looking like he's angry. Um. Uh, for me, 
Uh, this is more just kind of a posture thing and kind of illustrating him as a character. Because if somebody's hands are just, like, hanging on just, on just by their sides or in his the pocket, it doesn't seem very authoritative. It seems very casual or just kind of like they're lazy. But if somebody has their back straight and their hands clasped behind their back, that gives an air of authority and an air of confidence to a certain extent that I'm the person in charge in the room. That's kind of what I was trying to, to go with when in terms of the him always having his hands behind his back, yeah. Okay, then. Alright, so what about now that you're in full authority with him? Okay, then. Well, I kind of, one of the things is he just, yeah, no worries. Um, I think just at one point he, it, sh it says that he stands up from his chair and that he, looking down at his uh, erstwhile enemies, you could call them. And he just hates these people a lot. And just wants, probably wants to murder them. But that will come later. <sighs> Alright. Um, so, uh, I do have to get going. Are there any final questions before we uh, conclude tonight's le lecture? For me, no. There's that was all I had. I um, I wish I could pick your brain for longer than an hour, but I I, I <laughs> here. I'll do this. Would you mind making yourself uh available to the members of the server for questions occasionally in DM? That'd be cool. Sure, sure. That's totally fine. Uh, where would I? I'm actually that? gonna go ahead would and I... cut the recording there.